ist. In the second part of our six part series, we will get started on the solver and also add curved animation paths to our setup. So let's jump right in. So let's see where we have our distance attribute right there. So let's cut the wrangle with the distance attribute and move it into a solver. So let's grab a solver, dive in. And now we'll bring in or paste our wrangle from outside. Now we'll wire the input one into the first input of our wrangle and the previous frame into our second. So now we have the previous frame on the second input of our wrangle and on the first input we have all the incoming animation. So everything that's coming into our solver on input one is going straight through our wrangle and written out again. So let's go back on the timeline. The next thing we need is the normal of the previous frame over here. So let's create that vector n and since it's a point attribute we can get that attribute using the point function. So let's write point and since it's coming in on the second input we'll write a1 n for normal and the point number should be our pt num. So we do have the distance, we do have the normal and what we need to do next is to figure out the rotation amount. So that amount is the distance divided by the circumference. So let's call it circ and create a, another float called circ for circumference and that is 2 times pi times the radius of the object and instead of the radius we'll be using p scale and at the moment we don't oh sorry that's the amount and at the moment we don't have a p scale attribute yet right so it's set to zero so let's jump out of the solver and sure enough from the second frame on it's zero so let's create our p scale up here. For now let's do it on this wrangle. So f at p scale is 1, so that's our radius. So one thing to keep in mind is to really make sure that our radius is 1 and on our sphere we do have a radius of 0.5 and a uniform scale of 0.2. So all of these should be 1 and we'll set the radius with our p-scale later. So if we look at it from the front view, our radius is uh, really 1. Great. So if we want to scale it down now, we can do it with our p-scale. So let's do point 0.1 and zoom in a little bit. So now it should basically look like it did before, except for the fact that we can now control our radius with the p scale on our attribute wrangle. So let's jump back in. We do have our distance, we have our circumference, and now we can calculate how much in relation to its circumference the object traveled in one frame. So now we just need to rotate our normal. So let's create a matrix 3, a rotation matrix and call it M and let's write ident so we get an matrix that does nothing at first. Next we need to rotate that matrix so we can eventually rotate our vectors with it and we'll do that using a rotate function. And that function expects a matrix that's going to be rotated, an amount, 
how much it should be rotated and an axis. So now we need to figure out what the axis should be that the object will be rotated around. So let's just write amount and axis for now. And we still need to define our axis up here. So let's create a vector called axis. So let's jump out. So we do have our two vectors if we enable the visualizer. So our normal in blue and we do have a up vector in green and we also have the velocity. If I disable the line, that's the light blue one if you can see it. If I disable the grid, that's the velocity here. So in this case, we could rotate the normal around the up vector, but it's going to be much cleaner for later on if we do it properly now. So what we need now is the cross product of our blue normal and our light blue velocity vector. So we can rotate our object because later on we'll have a animation curve, not static vectors like we have over here. So let's create this cross product now and let's jump back in. So our axis should be the cross product of our normal, of our current normal and our velocity that is coming in each frame on input one. We should make sure that both of these are normalized. So let's do that now. Normalize the normal and normalize our velocity. Now we have our axis. We do have an amount and we do have to keep in mind that the amount is just a percentage. So what we need to do is to multiply this times two and times pi to get the percentage of a full rotation. So the only thing that's left for now should be to grab our normal of the previous frame, which is n, and rotate it with our rotation matrix, with this m, and assign it to the normal attribute for the copied points. So if we jump back out, let's get rid of the velocity and maybe the visualizers. Let's go to our animation path. So if we jump back to the beginning and hit play, we do have our rotation. Great. So let's get rid of that uh, debug setup for our distance in the beginning. So the next uh, thing we need to check is if this works not only for one sphere, but for multiple objects. So the next thing we'll be doing is simply duplicate our line like this. We'll offset it in Z by maybe 0.2. negative point two. Let's do three copies for now. Let's see. Jump to the first frame. Maybe point two five. Let's check. So that is looking pretty good for now. So now our setup is working for multiple objects. So in the next step we'll take a look at how to make the setup work on curved animation paths. So let's start with a switch so we can switch between our linear and curved animation paths. So we'll have our lines on the first input and on the second I want to 
have the objects move on a circular path. So let's add a circle on the ZX plane. Let's maybe scale it down to 0.5. Crank up the divisions and let's add another calf. So we'll be moving our first calf after our first copy so we can have different speeds for our two setups. Or let's maybe just delete this one and grab our first one so we have our animation already. So let's uh, connect the second calf to our switch. So we have our circle, we have our calf with extract enabled. We extract a point. Let's check whether it's working and that is uh, looking good. So let's put the display flag on our couple of points. Reset the solver just to be safe. Ghost our circle and have a look at the animation. So it's moving a little bit too fast. So let's adjust the second keyframe to 0.5. And we see that we get some sliding on our ball. So let's uh, check why that is. So let's uh, check our visualizers. So this is our normal in blue and the up in green that uh, determine how our sphere gets copied on, onto our point. And we see that the up vector well, it probably would help if we put the display flag on our solver so we can see what it's doing. So the normal gets uh, rotated, but our up vector, the green one, isn't. So what we want to be seeing is that our green up vector is perpendicular to the blue normal and to our uh, velocity vector, our motion path as well. And up here it happens to be, but um, back there it's not. So let's have a look how to do that next. So we'll uh, jump into our solver and we don't only need the normal from the previous frame, but also the up vector. So just copy the first line, change end to up and get the up vector from the previous frame. And we don't only want to rotate the normal, but the up vector as well from the previous frame. So we'll multiply it by our rotation matrix as well. So let's see what that's doing. So now we see both of our visualizers rotating. So the vectors itself are looking good. So let's check with the instance object. And that is looking much better now. Now that we have the server set up and can roll our objects along curved paths, let's take a look at adding multiple objects to our setup and randomize the initial orientations in the next part. See you there.